something watches over me, and it is not an angel. My shattered mind. Have you ever heard of the idea of spirit guides or divine protectors? How about the idea of a long-deceased family member watching over you, guiding you through life? I'm sure you have. I mean, haven't we all? Well, mine is different. For the longest time, I assumed I was the only one who could see it. No one else I had mentioned it to had any clue what I was speaking of. Friends and parents just assumed it was a childhood fantasy or the desperate desire to see and experience the spiritual realm. Others just thought me crazy. I'm not crazy. I know that sounds like something a crazy person would say, but someone else saw it. That thing. My guide, if you were to call it that what it is, it's not an angel. It's a monster. It wasn't until I reached the age of 22 that someone else finally noticed it. For the past 21 years, I was the only one who spotted the damn thing lurking around and watching me, tormenting me. It all started the day I was born. I wasn't meant to live past childbirth. Something wanted me dead and has been trying ever since. My birth was unpleasant to say the least, especially for my mother. Upon finally giving birth to me, she watched the doctors cut the umbilical cord from around my neck and rush me away from her waiting arms. I was essentially dead, strangled to the point where I no longer sucked in the bleach dare. Around half an hour, they wheeled me back into the room in what I can only assume was to be an incubator of sorts. If not for the technology of modern day, I likely would have been dead. Like all people, I don't remember that day. That is except for one thing, a voice. The first true voice I heard only moments before my heart restarted. I no longer know what it said and truthfully, I don't think I want to know what it said and when it chose me. However, I remember the sound of like wheezing breaths mixed with a sickly gurgling of pus and blood. It plagues me every night and it has for the past 22 years. Skip ahead to the second year of stolen life and once more death came for me. Being the adventure and curious kid I was, I sucked a marble like a bonbon straight down my throat. Of course, this was incredibly dangerous and stupid of me. From what I know, the marble had become lodged in my throat, and my frantic parents had tried everything to free the glass orb slowly draining the life from their child before them from my throat. They tried everything, even going so far as pushing their fingers into my throat in a vain attempt to make me puke the marble out, only to watch it slide deeper down. Until, unexpectedly, I spat it out without issue. To this day, they are still bewildered by the miracle I performed, but it wasn't me. I know that, because that's when I first saw it. Not fully. I think that was its decision not to scare the living daylight from me. I saw its hands on my shoulders, long, bony fingers curled down, gently tapping my tender flesh with prodigious claws. Gray skin stretched tightly over the scrawny bones, tightening and groaning with each stretch and tap upon my skin. I don't know why, but it calmed me rather than scaring me, possibly due to my lack of glimpsing the actual creature. Time passed relatively safely after that. I had no close calls with near-death experiences, and everything seemed normal. Well, it was the odd disturbance on my third birthday, but that was completely coincidental. I guess I should explain this rather than bypassing it. On my third birthday, the 31st of October, only one child knocked on our door to trick-or-treat. One child was unusual back then, but not uncommon. Yet, the strangest part was what he said to my parents when they asked where the other children were. The boy, around five or six, simply pointed to the roof just near the chimney, which was now highlighted by the full moon, and said, The strange man on the roof is scaring them away. Of course, no parent wants to hear this from anyone, so logically, my dad checked the roof. He found nothing, of course, which only made things worse, causing them to blatantly ignore the door's rings later that night. The next couple of years passed relatively safely with no real close calls or near-death experiences, nor any suspicious instances. That was until one autumn morning, me and my sister, three years older than me and born on Friday the 13th, were going to primary school on the bus with our mom. I was sucking on a sweet. Those red and white swirly ones that are hard-boiled and have the taste of strawberries and cream. Anyway, as I was saying, I was sucking on one of those and suddenly death saw his chance again through choking. As the sweet flew down my throat and lodged itself within its confines, I lunged forward tried to spit it out as my eyes began to water. My sister panicked, slapping my back furiously as my mom rose, pulling me up to smack my back again. 
smacking it harder with each strike. She grimaced, trying to force it out by putting her fist into my stomach and slamming me into her. At this point, my head had begun to swell slightly with pressure, and my skin had started to turn blue. I could feel my lips growing colder as tingles, almost like icy rain danced across my hands and fingers. My sight blurred, and the sounds around me faded out except for two things. The terrified screams of my sister and the high-pitched clicking of a tongue. People on the bus stared in silence as the driver continued his route. Men and women watched as my mom struggled to save me. As she watched her son dying before her, tears streamed from her face pouring down her cheeks to soak my neck as she tried to remain composed. Spinning me sharply, she apologized before ramming her fingers down my throat and holding them there. Heaving and lurching, I gagged, feeling the contents of my stomach move and gargle as my vision grew darker. The slight glimpse of gray skin hands on my mother's flooded my vision as they pushed her fingers deeper. Suddenly and violently, I vomited, spraying my stomach's contents across the floor and myself to the ridiculous courses of cheers from the other passengers, who were quickly silenced by my mother's hatred-filled glare. Her arms wrapped around me, embracing me, despite the sick coating my uniform, as I gasped air gulping it in greedily, watching the hands slide from my mother's shoulders to creep back down the bus, each long digit slipping over the seat's plastic gum-covered handlebars before scraping down the fabric of the last set of seats. After that, death had seemed to have given up on trying to deprive me of oxygen, instead choosing to try and hit me with cars or ravage me with dogs and push me off of steep hills and into lakes. Time passed like it would for any child, yet that near-death experience on the bus followed me like a stray dog emitting a necrotic stench. I only think back to it in the third person like I'm watching myself die. Yet, strangely enough, the creature is vacant from the memory, but I know it was there saving me once more. But why? Does it feed on my energy? My soul? Honestly, I don't know, but it's keeping me alive and I don't know why. Years passed by, friends came and went, and I caught glimpses of the creature. Always glimpses, but never the full thing. It wanted me to know it was still there, but not let me see it. On days, I would catch it behind trees just peeking around watching me. Its gray skin seemingly darker in the sunlight than at night. Large, milky white eyes stared at me as long as emaciated arms hung down touching the ground, each one twitching slightly as the seconds passed. Other times, I would hear it whispering or muttering as if talking to someone else only to grow silent when I glanced over in the direction of the sounds. At times, I would feel it. Like that feeling you can't quite explain when you know someone is watching you, but they're in the same room as you, just not visible. Eventually, nights became nightmares. Shadows danced on the walls of my room, flickering like jittery creatures, constantly twitching and convulsing as they dry heat and scuttled about on spindly legs, covered in wiry hairs. The light of the street would suddenly dim, making me glance at the window only to find a shadow quickly vanish from the ominous glow of the moon, it would crawl in through the blinds. Then came the knowing, the sensation of it watching me, not from across the room, but from directly behind me. I would awake from sleep, absolutely terrified, with wide eyes and trembling lips as I forced myself to act like I was still sleeping, only to lay staring at the wall and the shadows upon it. I would lay there watching as the shapes moved, rising higher, depicting a head slightly elongated and almost crescent-shaped in appearance, like a moon tilted sideways. A black mass would move rising higher along the wall, reaching over me before splitting in half. The dangling appendages were tendril-like veins, snapping together to entangle and create elongated fingers that stretched and crept closer. I could feel its breath on the back of my neck, not hot like a living creature, but cold, ice cold. No, freezing cold. Cold to the point, chills would run along my spine and my hairs would stand up with the goosebumps coating my skin like blisters. Strange, arcane whispers seeped from its jaws, accompanied by the stench of fermented water and damp leaves, tainted with a foul, pungent odor of rotting flesh. Squishing my eyes shut tightly was the only reprieve I had from that torment as it plucked and fed upon my fear, likely suckling down the sweet nectar and delight its dripping tongue swirling and lapping at the droplets dangling from its claws. 
These instances, though, were quickly replaced with the vivid dreams of torture, performed by nightmarish ghouls and demonic beings, each one of an otherworldly nature, bearing a vaguely anthropomorphic stature, with crowned skulls riddled with rivets and spines of twisted metal. Dreams of being burned alive and eaten by bark-covered figures with glowing crimson eyes, holding back tiny black irises that orbited smoldering orange pupils haunted me, their jaws chomping down on my exposed muscle and nerves, pulling it tight to stretch it out and wring it of its juices as it tears away, snapping with unnatural elasticity. Small beings like spiders covered in tiny bony bristles crawled across my naked body, jabbing it with tiny pincers as they moved in, burrowing into every orifice, their tiny forms squirming under my eyelids and chewing through my eardrums to pull webs across my brain, blanketing it in a foggy haze comparable to a hypnotic trance. The worst was the haunting spectral visions of a tree that plagued me both night and day, its form rising up to a deep purple and red sky, housing eclipsed suns of green flame. Bat-like creatures hung from its branches, screeching with silver eyes and frilled pointed ears. Membranes of humans' faces hugged their bodies as they stared at me with silvery eyes that boiled the blood pumping through my physical form. Giant, eight-legged beings sat in webs strewn from human intestines that constantly dripped blood onto the bundled up children below, trapped like flies. The beings laughed, muttering in alien tongues or ancient and arcane languages, causing images of cyclopean cities to flash within my frontal lobe. Their arms waved around, each one coated in severed human hands that twitched and writhed in agony. The eyes of empty black voids stared down from me from atop the sticky traps and their bulbous bodies. Reed breathed deeply, sucking in the red mist of blood from the air, its roots pulsing and flickering with ghastly green and pink light, mixed with a hue of magenta and red. Bell voices called out singing lullabies into my ears, urging me closer as the hand rested on my shoulder, heavy and gray, guiding me toward the tree. My eyes would snap open with a scream as sweat poured from every possible pore, soaking my clothes and drenching my bed sheets. As I panted feverishly, quivering in abstract horror, sleep served me no sanctuary from the creature, nor from its masters and minions. I visited a shrink once. He told me it was a phase and just signs of an overactive imagination. I have that, but this isn't that. This is hell itself taunting me. Some sort of divine punishment for a living, for escaping death and surviving of making a mockery of those who would call themselves gods. Recently, though, I found camping eased my mind more than my own room. Something about being exposed to nature somehow calmed my dreams and visions, along with my suffering mind. Well, it did for a time, but it led to something worse. Much, much worse. A few weeks ago, I invited a friend to camp with me in a forest. This forest, however, is said to be one of the UK's most haunted forests with several murder cases unsolved and dozens of missing people's reports. Being the paranormal and cryptic lovers we are, we thought it the perfect place for a ghost hunt and a paranormal investigation. We brought what we needed, tents, sleeping bag, torches, etc. You know, the usual camping supplies. I also managed to get my hands on an old emergency survival kit that held rations, a flint and striker, water purification tablets, you know, that sort of stuff. Made me feel like I was preparing for an apocalypse having all this stuff, but nonetheless, it was worth buying. After traveling to the forest, we spent the day walking around, laughing, and generally being stupid, picking up twigs and pretending to have sword fights or trying martial arts moves, which we failed badly at, and I mean badly. We tested the tablets to find the water surprisingly refreshing, despite the slight metallic taste it left within the water. I guess the tablets only do so much and really haven't been upgraded to make it taste better. We took pictures on a disposable camera, hoping to catch pictures of Bigfoot or a ghost. At the time, we hadn't noticed, but we caught things I can't explain. In nearly every picture, there were figures that were definitely not there when we took the pictures themselves. The figures appeared to be almost transparent, which honestly scared the shit out of me, but also got me really hyped. I mean, we actually caught evidence of ghosts. The night came quicker than we anticipated, 
So we set up camping, making a fire and a small set of trees shaped like a circle. We laughed and joked despite the creep factor washing in like a thick fog. The highlight of our trip actually came from discovering a bag of sweets in the emergency survival kit. Childish, I know, but they were a bag of mixed boiled and soft sweets. Then things got weird. Really, really weird. Eerily weird. Firstly, it was just the feeling like we were being watched. Then something terrifying happened. We heard a scream. Not just a simple old, ow my toe kind of scream. This was somebody screaming bloody murder type of scream. To make matters worse, it was a blood-curdling woman scream coming from somewhere deep in the woods. My friend jumped up as shining a torch into the trees as he whispered, Did you just fucking hear that? Sitting up slowly and hiding the fear flooding through me, I answered, telling him it was obviously just a fox. If you've never heard a fox at night, it's scary. No joke, they sound like babies crying and women screaming. He refused to believe my comment, despite me having more knowledge on animals than him. But I'll admit, I was just as scared as him and glad he was alert. But not so glad he was shining that torch into the woods. Now, we don't get wolves here or bears, so when he said, I think I see eyes over there, I shit myself. Jumping up, I swallowed the fear lodged in my throat and following his pointed finger and the torch's light. Lo and behold, there was something reflecting light like eyes. Now this terrified me to my core. Nothing should be doing that out here, and those weren't deer's eyes. Those were too close together for that. This was clearly predatory. My mind raced, thinking of tales of big cats in the UK countryside and the rake. That thing scared the crap out of me. We watched the eyes for at least an hour before they just vanished into the trees without a sound. Sharing a glance, we decided that maybe we should leave and not risk staying the night. Making up our minds and gathering our things, we ignored the distant screams of possible foxes or women as the woods grew silent. Too silent. If you know anything about the woods... It's that when they go quiet, it's not a good sign. It means something around that's dangerous. Noticing this, I straightened, staring off into the trees, as my friend stuffed everything into the bags with a messy, rushed action. Not that I blamed him. Then, my heart dropped. My friend no longer stuffed the bags as I glanced at him. Instead, he was staring off into the woods, his eyes wider than I've ever seen to the point where I thought they would burst out. His body trembled violently and not to shame him, but he had pissed himself. If I had seen what he had told me, I'd have done the same. Leaning forward, I asked him what was wrong, before shining my light into the trees he was transfixed on. Tears streamed down his face as he whispered, We need to go. Okay, I said, helping him grab his stuff as he cried, grabbing my hand. We need to go now. Leave this crap. We need to go now. Concerned and terrified, I obliged grabbing only what was necessary when we moved, practically holding hands as we glanced around. Moving toward the direction of the car, we'd heard footsteps and twigs snapping, making us move faster and more frantically as we rapidly went into a sprint, practically diving into the car and whacking the headlights to full beam illuminating the car park. What's wrong? What did you see? I asked, fearing for my friend's life and my own, as he continued to cry slightly. Now my friend never cries out of fear. So to see this really made me nervous. Waiting for his reply, I scanned the trees for movement, only catching a glimpse of something moving behind a tree. The shape of a human leg in its claws dragging along the ground behind it. My eyes widened as my friend muttered to himself, pressing his face into his hands as the creature paused, turning toward me with a smile. It was at that point I noticed its full appearance. The creature stood around eight feet tall at least, its skin was pale gray, almost translucent, revealing organs below and the pulsing hearts of black muscle beating within. Glowing white eyes stared back at me as a thin smile revealed the needle-like teeth jutting down from its jaws. Its face was slim, gaunt, and tight, yet oddly human. Long, scrawny arms hung down by its side, touching the ground as long, digitigrade legs covered in tight flesh supported its emaciated body. Large, black, feathered wings tipped with clawed fingers hung down from its back, partially folded to hide the row of spiny protrusions sticking out along its spinal column. My eyes refused to blink as they burned screaming at me. It stared at me, smiling. 
its free hand rising toward its mouth to wipe away the dark patches of moisture glistening around its thin lips. My body trembled as the creature smiled wickedly, forcing the skin to split along its face, allowing its jaws to reveal the full majesty of the maw stretching halfway up its head. I, I stammered trying to speak as the creature turned waving over its shoulder, walking back into the woods with the body of someone. It would only be a week later that I learned it was a man who was a known rapist and murderer who had escaped police in the area. Knowing this now makes me sick to my stomach and has stopped me from going anywhere near the woods. We drove home trembling and silent until my friend managed to tell me what he saw. I never told him what I saw. I didn't want to scare him any more than he already was. I saw something. A creature. I glanced at him speaking. Like what? A fox or a wolf? He refused to turn as his eyes grew redder with his tempered words. No, not a fucking fox. It was human at first. That made my jaw sag as I thought back to the body the creature had. He was watching us, just smiling like a creep. Then, his words trailed off and he sucked back the tears and snot, threatening to leak from him once more. Then, something came out of the trees behind him. It just picked him up by the neck. I sat silent and filled with fear from what would come next. It didn't even look at me. Just lifted a hand and dug a finger right through his eye, pushing it out the back of his head. My friend paused briefly, sucking back in a shaky breath before stuttering. I guess he died instantly as he didn't even scream. But then he tried to fight back. That only made the thing smile. He turned to me. It fucking smiled. My heart skipped a beat as I imagined it running up alongside the car to tap on the window to smile at me with that awful grin like a demonic shark. That's when it gripped his arm, tearing it off like, like, like it tore it off. His sudden yell broke my train of thought as I glanced at the moon shining down on us with silver light. It clasped his jaws around the face, crushing it. I heard the bones crack. He's whispered this last part, peering over me as I rubbed a shaky hand across my brow. Just keep driving and get us out of here and back to the city. It, it'll be safer. Then we can go to the police. I said, trying to stay calm as possible as he snorted, gripping the wheel with a white knuckle grip. They won't believe us. They'll say we we're on drugs or that we killed them. We'll be sent to a nut house or locked up. And as much as I hated to admit it, he was right. No one would believe us. We remained silent for the rest of the journey home, each one of us anxiously staring out the window, snapping our head round at the slightest sound, light or passing car. We were petrified, and it showed evidently when we got pulled over for speeding. A couple of cops asked us usual questions. Have you taken drugs? Have you drank alcohol this evening? We lied, telling them that we had a family emergency but they didn't fully buy it. I could tell when they went off to talk to each other about our panic state and clear terror-filled eyes. Eventually, they let us go on a warning, stating they would shadow us to the next city, then we were to go to our emergency, and then straight home. Hmm, home. Like that'll do anything. That thing knows exactly where I live. I only hope it didn't know where he lived. Luckily, my question was answered when my friend called me telling me everything was fine and he's getting over the night as best he can for now anyway. I've been to check on him, but he refused to answer the door and has stuck to keeping every blind and curtain shut. I haven't told him that I saw the thing on his roof once, mainly because I don't know how to tell him, but also because I think it was just following me. I had watched it stalking me from the rooftops, leaping from each one with a strange grace before peeking over the chimneys. I haven't mentioned this to anyone either, but I'm having a new dream, and I think it's my death. Or at least my limbo? Hell? Oh, I don't know anyway. I don't even have to sleep to see the dream either. I just have to shut my eyes and there I am. Imagine a field, a vast open expanse of land. Now shroud that land in a thick gray fog, like that on an autumn morning. Now imagine black trees, naked and devoid of leaves, appearing in the fog, but remove the trunks and gaze at the branches stretching out like veins of black blood across the sky. That's where I am, and there's no sun, no light, no sound, 
except one, the wheezing breath I heard when I was born. I know the creatures behind me in the dream waiting, expecting me to run, but I think it's pointless. This thing has followed me all my life. Now, if I die, I will greet it like an old friend, hopefully. It's past midnight now as I write this. I'm terrified. The dreams have stopped now, only replaced with something worse, much worse. I'm trying not to look at it, but it knows. I know it's there watching me write. It's in my room, sitting on the desk by my window. I can see its wings clearly now from my peripheral vision. The things I thought were feathers are actually human hands with hundreds of fingers coated in finely placed feathers. Its eyes are dim, sucking in the light from the landing and the street light outside. No, not the street. The street is gone, replaced with a crimson sky. I can see the moon eclipsed in the sky, spilling a red hue into the air. I can see the tree and hear the bat-like creatures. I'm terrified. Please, if you read this, don't look for me or it. Once you've been chosen, there's no escaping. If you've ever suffered a near-death experience, you're lucky. I think it feeds on the life you shouldn't have had. The more I try to resist looking, the harder it gets. It's shifting now, rolling its shoulders and rubbing its neck like it's bored or just aching from watching me. Its teeth are chattering. Oh God, it's eating a baby. I can... Oh no, 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 it's, it's still alive. I can't help myself, I have to look. No, I'm not ready to die. I don't want to go. It's five in the morning now. It stopped eating around three. I looked at it and it just smiled at me and spoke. Its voice was putrid, slow and whispery, yet gruff like gravel grinding together and stone breaking bone. Gargles of blood and pus accompanied the wheezing as it spoke, dragging out each word as it savored them telling me, you are safe, my child. Father is here.